Hi, everyone. Shana Tova. One of my sabbatical goals this past year, aside from spending many blissful hours in a pottery studio making what amounted to an abundance of truly mediocre pottery, was to learn, to take a lot of time to learn. And there was so much to learn. I wanted to swim in an ocean of historical fiction. I wanted to read New Yorkers cover to cover. I wanted to hear Shirim, Torah studies from the best teachers in the United States and in Israel. As much as my sister, who is an urban homesteader and my sabbatical coach, urged me to let the land lay fallow during this time, I found myself absolutely desperate to maximize my time, so much so that I literally caught myself once listening to mindfulness podcasts on time and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, I, I slowed down, and I was able to discover a few teachers whose work I have found completely gripping. One of those teachers is, uh, is named Judy Klitzner. She's a senior educator at Pardes in Jerusalem, and she teaches what she calls subversive sequels in the Bible, a concept that I'm completely captivated by, as you will see. So here's how it works. Say there's a biblical story, imagine, that's somewhat morally problematic or theologically challenging. So think, for example, of the Akedah, the story of the binding of Isaac, which we will be reading tomorrow. Now, one of the most disturbing elements of this story is that when God tells Abraham to take his son, his beloved son, up the mountain and offer him as a sacrifice, what is clearly an appalling and atrocious thing to ask of a parent Abraham, our ancestor, a beacon of moral leadership, fully fails to challenge God in any way. Instead, he heads out early the next morning, prepared to do the unthinkable, to raise a knife to his own child's neck. And God, in the story, seems very pleased with Abraham's subservience. And so we're left to wonder, as many people have over the generations, is this the desired religious consciousness? Is the Torah actually telling us to stifle our moral intuition, to ignore our most human instincts, even to protect a vulnerable child in order to fulfill the demands made by an often impulsive God? Is that the mark of a religious actor in our tradition? In the face of a, of a difficult text like this, and there are many, people generally either bow their conscience to the presumed authority of the text, or, or they walk away. They say the Torah is anachronistic and irrelevant and immoral. But Judy Klitzner offers a third approach in which the text itself undergoes a radical revision in a subsequent story, but this time with a twist. And that twist often dramatically alters the moral message of the original story. She calls this a subversive sequel. So here's how that works in the case of the Akedah, for example. Klitzner picks up on what she calls subtle echoes between the story of the binding of Isaac, the Akedah, and a later biblical narrative that also focuses on a parent who's also a God-fearing man, who's also in a somewhat complicated relationship with God, and that man is Job. Abraham and Job's stories you might have never thought of before as connected to one another, but in many ways they're actually very similar, but they also differ in one really critical way. Whereas Abraham remained silent and compliant, resigned to his child's fate, Job, when facing a similar landscape of loss, turns to God in rage. Why do you hide your face? Why have you turned me into your enemy, Job says. From Job, we learn that to be God's beloved servant requires not passive acquiescence, but protest against injustice, even when that injustice is authored by God. That, in the story of Job, is actually seen as an incredible act of faith. And in the end, both the protagonist and God evolved from the problematic, simplistic outlook of the earlier narrative from the book of Genesis. Call it a subversive sequel, 
or I like the language of redemption narrative. And my God, it has given me so much joy to uncover this radical new take on so many of our beloved stories. Now, what often happens when you find a great teacher who has a really novel approach to something is the idea kind of seeps into your subconsciousness. And you see it everywhere. So the idea of subversive sequels became for me a frame for everything that I was seeing and encountering. I turned back to some early scholarship from the brilliant Tikva Frey-Merkensky about ancient Near Eastern mythology, in particular, the epic of Atrahasis. Now, David told me to warn you that I'm feeding you the vegetables first in this sermon, so just bear with me for a minute. It's not, it's not often that the epic of Atrahasis comes up in the first five minutes when you're trying to hook people into what you're sharing. But, but in fact, this story predates the Bible by more than 700 years. And it is an eerie precursor to the Torah's version of both the creation and the flood stories in the book of Genesis. Now, the reason I'm talking about this today is because when I was in seminary, I was really convinced that in order to consider Torah in light of any of these other ancient mythologies somehow degraded the sanctity of our own text. And now I really see the opposite. So I'm gonna spare you the details of the comparative analysis, but I wanna tell you that it occurred to me as I read about the epic of Atrahasis that the Torah itself is a subversive sequel. It was crafted in response to the prevalent worldview of human exploitation and divine violence and callousness of the Near Eastern mythologies. The Torah instead is telling us a story of undeserved love, of covenant, of forgiveness and human striving. Meaning this, our most sacred text is itself a polemic, a revolution against the norms of the ancient world, a new version, a different story now that's intended to inspire human beings to manifest a new and different kind of reality. Now, last month I sat with a friend and ICAR advisory board member, Ari Wallach, just before his book, Long Path, came out. And Ari told me that the driving question of his book is how can we be the ancestors that our descendants a thousand years from now need us to be? It was a summer of heat waves and wildfires. The tarmac in London was melting as we spoke. It was about to hit 112 degrees in Los Angeles. Roe had been overturned, and red states were lining up to pass increasingly restrictive laws criminalizing abortion and attacking bodily autonomy. The school board in Tennessee banned mouse because Spiegelman's mother's mouse breast was exposed in one image, rendering the book unfit for children. We're gonna talk more about that on Yom Kippur. And there was a whirlwind of anti-LGBTQ bills that were fi filed over the first half of the year, most of them specifically targeting the trans community in what amounted to a coordinated effort to eliminate trans people from public life. As we've navigated these, these cascading, intersecting crises, I have thought often about Dr. King's most ominous warning, which he delivered in a sermon in 1967, April, in Riverside Church in New York. He said, over the bleached bones and jumbled residue of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. I thought about that as my family and I walked through the Colosseum in Rome before the Icar Europe trip this summer. Every life eventually ends. Every empire eventually falls. At some point, it will be too late for us to. And my greatest fear over these past several years is that we are rapidly approaching the point of no return. Our descendants a thousand years from now? I scoffed at Ari Wallach. Given the devastation to our environment, the ruptures in our democracy and our society, do you really think we'll even be around in a hundred years, I said? Ah, said Ari. That's what progressives often do. We're so alarmed by the trends that we begin to believe that there are no alternative outcomes. 
but there's almost always an alternative outcome. Ari argues that where we land after times of rupture and disorder very much depends on our willingness to invest in long-term visions and dreams, even as we're being tossed around in the storm. And isn't that the very hallmark of this season? The insistence that as long as the breath of life remains in us, it's not too late for us to write our own subversive sequel, or at least to create the conditions for the next generation to do so. Dan Gilbert, who's a Harvard psychologist, writes that human beings are works in progress that mistakenly think that they're finished. On some level, we think it's already over, that real change is simply no longer possible. But this is nothing more than a failure of personal imagination. We cannot imagine a different future, and therefore we assume that there can't be one. And yet I've seen again and again a counter testimony to that kind of dead end thinking in this very community. The estranged father who, after a lifetime of running from his family, reveals an uncharacteristic tenderness before his death, opening pathways to understanding and forgiveness with his children. The grown sisters who become best friends in adulthood despite their mother's problematic relationship with her sister and their grandmother's with her sister. The child of abuse who grew up to be the very embodiment of maternal love. Remember, God's very name is Ehiyah Asher Ehiyah. I will be what I will be. You're like me, God saying, a work in progress. We're not done yet. It's not too late for our country, and it's not too late for you or for me. And that's why Dr. King called us to act with the fierce urgency of now, to turn the tide before it is too late. It turns out that stubbornly trusting in a better future is actually very Jewish, as Ari reminds us that as the Israelites walked through the desert for those 40 years, facing plague and war and uncertainty, it was a vision of a land flowing with milk and honey that kept them going. I caught glimpses of this kind of thinking throughout Ikar's journey through Central Europe this summer. As our group followed the train tracks into Auschwitz-Birkenau, as we wondered how could it be that any person could possibly survive such dehumanization, such cruelty, I remembered a passage from Viktor Frankl, the psychiatrist an enslaved laborer in that camp. He was marching with fellow prisoners one day to a work site just outside the camp, and it was bitter cold, and he was hungry, and he was broken, and he had already witnessed a lifetime of horrors, but he somehow managed to transport himself through his thoughts to another place and another time. Frankel writes, I saw myself standing on a platform in a well-lit, warm, pleasant lecture room. In front of me sat an attentive audience in comfortable upholstered seats. I was giving a lecture on the psychology of the concentration camp. All that oppressed me in that moment became objective, seen and described from the remote viewpoint of science. And by this method, he writes, I succeeded somehow in rising above the situation, above the sufferings of the moment, and I observed them as if they were already of the past. This act of imagination became a lifeline for Frankel, lifting him from the hellscape of his present to a future that, while almost unimaginable, was ultimately possible. And as many of you know, astonishingly, miraculously, only 11 months after the liberation of Auschwitz, Frankel stood in a well-lit lecture hall in Vienna, and he delivered those lectures that he had recreated in his own mind writing his own subversive sequel. One needn't have to suffer the indignities of the Shoah in order to find meaning in the practice of future orienting. It is a peculiarity of man that he can only live by looking to the future, Frankel said. The one who lost faith in the future, his future was doomed. And Frankel wasn't the only one to come to this awareness, obviously. In Warsaw, we spent an afternoon in the Oneg Shabbat archives of Dr. Emanuel Ringelbaum. In 1939, Rinkelbaum and a number of colleagues began to document the reality of Jewish life under Nazi occupation. They gathered testimonies, 
from the Jewish community, from educators and journalists, from artists and children, and they ultimately were able to capture tens of thousands of documents, written reports, everything from grocery inventories to underground newspapers to lists of names and ultimately deportation schedules. Through hunger and humiliation, through illness and grief, they became singularly focused on archiving the details of the extermination effort. And when most of the Warsaw Ghetto was deported to Treblinka in the summer of 1942, these archivists began to bury their work underground. I want to ask you to think about what that means for a moment. At that point, they were no longer writing in order to stir the conscience of the world to the atrocities that were being committed so that maybe, God willing, help would come. They knew already at that point that no help was coming. And even still, with every ounce of energy they had, they continued to write and to bury, to write and to bury. Why did they do that? Because on some level, they knew that they would die. But they also trusted that someone someday would find what they had written and would reconstruct their lives and honor their death. Someone someday would care about what they had suffered through. After the war, portions of those archives were dug up. And those documents today are considered some of the richest testimony that we have to what our Jewish family endured during those terrible years and to their steadfast commitment to a future that they knew they were never going to see. On our way from Auschwitz to Budapest, we spent two nights in Slovakia, in Kosice, where our dear Susanna grew up and her family still resides. There was once a flourishing Jewish community of 12,000 Jews before the war, one in every five residents. Nearly all of them were deported to Auschwitz. There's a big synagogue, beautiful, right in the middle of this town. And it was used during that time as a center for deportation. Thousands of Jews were crammed into that building for days to await transfer to Auschwitz. Now, for decades after the war, the synagogue sat empty and desolate. But a couple of years ago, some people entered the building in order to try to clean it up and maybe renovate. And they began to pull some of the wooden pews from the walls. And what they found was absolutely breathtaking. Tucked behind the cover of these giant wooden pews were pencil scrawlings that had been written surreptitiously by those who were awaiting deportation in that sanctuary. We are here, they wrote. It's 1944. We do not know where they will take us. We wept when we read those messages, the agony, the desperation, a time capsule that had remained hidden for 65 years. As nearly the entire Jewish community was murdered, a whole world disappeared. Literally, nobody left to find these hidden notes. But then there we were, generations later, a bunch of American Jews looking at a message in a bottle. And I realized that they wrote those messages, they archived those documents for us. Even as terrible as their fate was, even as death became more inescapable, we were the future that they were dreaming of. They dreamt that some day, somehow, one day, the Jewish people would survive. And maybe some of them would care enough to come to Kosice and come sit in a synagogue. And maybe they would look behind the wooden pews and they would find those messages. And then their deaths would matter and their lives would matter too. And maybe it would somehow change us too. Maybe confronting that devastating history, reconstructing those stories would awaken us to the intimations of tyranny in our own time, to the signals all around us portending future disaster, to the ways that we so readily acclimate to racist nationalist movements that are fueled by hatred and fear, even when they threaten our lives and our collective future, until one day, it's just too late. In 1944, there was a conductor in a barrack in Auschwitz who wrote a symphony with a piece of charcoal on toilet paper. There was death all around him. For whom did he write this symphony? Surely, I imagine that creating art in that place was a stunning act of resistance and assertion of agency 
It was for him, but it was also for us. It was for you and it was for me and it was for anyone else who would care enough to wanna to see that symphony played by a full orchestra one day, which it was in Israel just a couple of years ago. Because when everything else was taken from them, these people trusted on some level in a redemption narrative. They had faith that someone someday would find the remnants of their stolen lives and would write a sequel that would subvert the tragic trajectory of their story. We know that Hitler nearly achieved his goal of a Judenrein continent, a continent fully cleansed of its Jews. It wasn't only the city centers. This hit me so hard as we biked and drove through the vast and varied countryside of Europe. It was every farm and townhouse in nearly every single village across a continent. You wanna understand Jewish trauma? The Nazis' fevered fixation with hunting down every last Jew so consumed them that until the end they were focusing on death marches and destroying evidence rather than pushing back against the allied armies that were advancing on Berlin. Nearly every one of the Jews of those towns died. But we are alive. Gosha and Susanna and their families are alive. Which means that this story didn't end. It means that we who are still around must continue writing the story now. And that is precisely what we're doing here today. After the devastation of the Shoah, the Jewish people desperately needed a sequel. We needed a sequel that would subvert the narrative, not only of the Holocaust, but of generations of exile and persecution and oppression and genocide. We desperately needed a redemption narrative. And that is a weighty mandate. Could we transform in a hostile world, Jewish dying? to even in a hostile world, Jewish thriving. Over the last 77 years, the greatest minds and hearts of our people have devoted themselves to that project. The desperate yearning to affirm Jewish vitality has led to a vibrant and diverse and flourishing American Jewish community. And the mightiest example, maybe in the history of all the Jewish people, the miraculous establishment of the state of Israel the ultimate subversive sequel. And yet, let us be clear, we sabotage our own story when the vehicle for our redemption manifests in the dispossession of another people, the deprivation of their rights and dignities. And that's why so many people in this room work so devotedly to author a true counter narrative to the horrors of our own past. We know that there can be no real Jewish thriving until we achieve a just shared future, not only for ourselves, but for all who dwell among us. And I know this to be possible. Of course, America too needs a redemption narrative. We need a subversive sequel here in this country too. A chance to course correct, to finally lay to rest the part of our story that's rooted in greed and supremacy in heresy and human cruelty. We need a new story and we can write it. One thing we know though, is that the people and the institutions that are invested in the original story will resist the sequel with every ounce of strength they have. In some cases, their insistence on the status quo, on the original being the only way, renders them prepared to destroy the whole franchise rather than share the credits. You understand what I'm saying? So they will ban books, and they will fire teachers, and they will spread lies and hate, they will threaten violence, and they will even steal voting machines, anything that they can to prevent that sequel from coming out. That's how afraid they are of the redemption narrative, a redemption narrative that shifts the power dynamic and charts a new course for us all. And the weight of their resistance to this new story might be so great that we might be tempted at times to just step back and throw up our hands and say, it is too late. We've already lost. Some of us said that this summer as we helplessly watched a dubiously constituted Supreme Court zealously strip away decades of progress and rights. We are not wrong to be alarmed. And I am afraid that one day over the bleached bones and jumbled residue of our own civilization will be written the pathetic words, too late. But it's not yet too late. 
as long as we cast our gaze to the milk and to the honey, we can break out of that original script. We can write a new and a better and a, a more just and a more inclusive story. We can protect our earth. We can build a true multiracial democracy that is rooted in equal justice, that defends the dignity of every single person, that strives to embody that great vision of beloved community. I want our descendants in a hundred years or in a thousand to look back at us and see that we did absolutely everything we could to create the conditions for a redemption narrative for us all. I want to close today with the words of Gila Zagstein, written in August of 1942 in the midst of the Warsaw Ghetto deportation. She calls this her last will and testament, and it was found among the Oneg Shabbat documents. She wrote the following. I wish to say goodbye to my friends and to my work. I'm calm now. I am destined to be killed. I'm trying to hide some of my work, which I hereby donate to the Jewish Museum to be founded in the future in order to restore pre-war Jewish culture and to learn the terrible tragedy of the Jewish community of Poland during the war. I only want my name and the name of my daughter Margalit Lichtenstein to be remembered. Margalit is my pride and joy, gifted and talented and beautiful. So much sorrow, so much pain. Be well, dear friends. Be well, my Jewish people. Never allow such destruction to happen again. Again, I ask us to think about what it means for a Jew who is about to be deported to Treblinka, about to face certain death, along with her daughter and her entire community, to entrust her artwork and her daughter's memory, the two things most precious to her in this world, to a non-existent Jewish museum in an improbable, almost unimaginable Jewish future, but one that she has full faith will be built nevertheless. Two months after I read Gila's words and I saw her artwork in a museum in Warsaw, my daughter Eva left for college. And she called me excitedly in her first week in order to tell me that she registered for the most amazing class, exploring Yiddish land. So, Eva went to Jewish high school right here in this building. So I have to admit that I was a little bit disappointed when I first heard this. It's just one class, but I had hoped that the college was gonna broaden her scope of interest and understanding. And to be honest, this felt a little bit narrow, a little bit familiar. But then I read the description of the course. This course will center on Yiddish art and culture and literature that blossomed in Poland before the Holocaust. And I realized in that moment that my kid right now is fulfilling Gila Zagstein's final wish because her beautiful Margalit could not. And that, it's very clear to me, is some kind of redemption narrative or at the very least, an incredible blessing. I wish you all Shana Tovah.